When you talk about DevOps, you might hear the names of a number of tools such as Docker, Kubernetes, Ansible, Terraform, Git, GitHub, Jenkins, Prometheus, Grafana, and it might be overwhelming the number of tools and technologies that there are to learn. In this video, I'm going to try and demystify these tools by walking you through a story. A story of how you start with a small application where you don't really need a large infrastructure, but as you expand, how each of these tools come in at different stages of your product to help with the different challenges you face. This is a very high level overview of how all of these tools fit in to your infrastructure as well as your development workflows. And I'm sure by the end of this video, you will leave with a good understanding of where these fit. So it all starts with an idea. So that's you. And you have this idea that you think is going to change the world. So you're going to build a website that books tickets to Mars in advance so people don't have to pay too much or wait in a queue in the future. So what do you do? As any other intelligent developer would do, you start with the market research. Oops, sorry, I got that wrong. As any other intelligent developer would do, you get coding. You open your favorite editor and start building your idea. And hours later, you have the first version of your product ready and it's time to share it with the world. Now, how would you do that? This code is still running on your laptop and is only accessible at HTTP localhost 8080 for now. Even if you find a way to share it with the world from your laptop, when you shut down your laptop, no one would have access to it. So you need to host your application on a system that is never turned off. So you identify a server that is either a physical server in a data center or a virtual machine in a data center or in the cloud and you copy the code to it and you run it. Now you can't just run an application on a system by just copying code to it. You need to have the system configured first to be able to run it. For example, if the application was written in Python or Java or any other programming languages, then you must have one of these programming languages or the runtimes in place on the server too. If the application uses any libraries or packages, then you must have those exact version of libraries and packages configured on the server too in the exact same way. Now you develop your application on your laptop so that that becomes your development environment and the server you host your application on becomes your production environment. Now once all of that is set up, you now have your application running on the server. The server has an IP, so it's now accessible at that IP address, but you don't want to have to share an IP address to people, so you purchase a domain name and map that to your server. Now you have something to share to the world. You're all set and you're now ready to share it with the world. So you tweet it out tagging a certain individual and that certain individual retweets it and off you go. Your website is now famous and you now have thousands of users visiting your site and booking their future travel to the red planet. Now let's look at our workflow as of now. The current workflow involves the development phase where you write your code on your laptop. This could be on your favorite text editor like VS Code or PyCharm. Now the code in text format is not good enough to run. To run it as an application by the end user, it needs to be in an executable format if you're familiar with Windows or binary file if you're familiar with Linux. And converting code from a text format to a binary or executable format is known as building the code. And there are tools available such as the Python setup tools or Maven or Gradle for other platforms. And you usually have a build script that invokes these tools to build the application. Now once built, the executable is moved to a production environment, in this case our server, and run in production. And that's referred to as the deploy stage a simple three-step process. So there are so many variations to this process and different ways and tools used to do this, but I'm keeping it super high level for now. Now you have users now visiting your website and users are requesting for more features. So you bring in your friends along as additional developers. And now everyone is working on their own development environments, but on the same code base. And they all copied their code to a central hub whenever ready. And now they're stepping on each other's toes and working on the same files at the same time and creating conflicts. And you need a solution that can help collaborate. And that's where Git comes in. Git helps all developers to work on the same application at the same time and collaborate efficiently. Now everyone installs and configures Git on their machines. 
um, and that's going to help in easily pulling the latest Git code from the central hub using the git pull command, add their own changes and push it back using the git push command. And the central hub is a cloud-based platform that serves as a central location for all code. So Git is the underlying uh, technology and GitHub is the publicly hosted Git-based central repository of code where you can configure projects, um, organizations, users, and define different access for different users. And some other similar platforms are GitLab and Bitbucket. So to summarize, Git is the command line tool or the underlying technology that enables versioning of code and collaboration between multiple developers. And GitHub is the Git-based publicly accessible repository of code where you push your code to. And it has a web interface where you invite new developers, manage your project, manage issues with your projects, add documentation to your code, etc. So now with four developers and Git and GitHub in place, the development issues are sorted. However, we still need to move code manually to the production environment every time something new is ready. So the previous workflow involved developing code in your development environment, then building the code to an executable package and then deploying it to production. However, now with multiple developers, the code needs to be built with the changes contributed by all of the developers. So building on the laptop itself no longer works as an individual's laptop may not have all the latest changes. It makes sense to move the build operation to a dedicated build server that gets the latest version of the code and builds it before moving it to production. So now pushing um, new builds to production is risky as it might have uh, introduced new bugs or broken something that worked before. So we need to test it in a test environment too. So here's how the workflow looks now. Every developer develops code in their development environment in their own laptops and pushes it to GitHub. You then manually copy the code to your build server and then build the code to an executable, then manually copy the executable to the test server and then test the application to make sure that it works as expected and that no new bugs are introduced and then manually copy the executable to production environment and deploy it. And because it's a manual job and requires a set of manual tasks, you decide to move all new code containing new features to the production environment once a week. However, that's not very well accepted by users or by your fellow developers because some of the minor features are ready and don't necessarily have to wait till the end of the week to be pushed to production. And the entire process of manual deployment itself takes a week to execute on its own when the code base and features grow. Now you want to be able to release features faster and more frequently with less manual effort. And that's where CICD tools come in. Now CICD stands for continuous integration and continuous delivery or deployment and tools like Jenkins, GitHub Actions or GitLab CICD um, help you automate these manual tasks and build a pipeline. With one of these tools configured, every time code is pushed, it is automatically pulled from the GitHub repository to the build server and then built and then the executable is automatically moved to the test server and tested and on successful testing it is automatically moved to the production server and deployed. Now this allows changes, features and bug fixes to move faster through the pipeline and be deployed more often with lesser manual effort ultimately enabling you and your team to resolve issues quicker, ship features faster and make your users more happier. Now with Git, GitHub and CI/CD pipelines in place, we have enabled our team to make changes to our application and get them to production servers seamlessly. However, it's still not all that seamless. Remember the dependencies and libraries that we talked about earlier, the ones that are required to, uh, for the applications to run on any system? These dependencies need to be configured the exact same way on the servers. And this means that if a new package is required, this needs to be manually installed and configured on all the servers that this code runs. And this now is still a manual task. If you miss out configuring one of these packages with the right version in the right way, it will lead to the software not working and resulting in unexpected outcomes on different systems. And that's where containers come in. Containers help package the application and its dependencies into an image 
that can then be run on any system without worrying about dependencies. So now during the build, you build a container image with the application and its dependencies uh, packaged into it. And all other systems can now simply run a container from that image without worrying about installing and configuring libraries and dependencies. Now, one technology that enables working with containers is Docker. With Docker, the developer can create a Docker file which uh, specifies what the dependencies are and that Docker file can be used during the build to build an image and that image can then be run on any server using a simple Docker run command. Now, the major functionality of a container is that it enables isolation between processes. So each container is an isolated instance, and this allows us to run multiple containers, each having its own separate instance of the application on the same server. Now, let's focus on the production side of things, on the production server. Currently, we have one server, but with our users increasing, we want to be able to add more servers and run our application on all of them. Now that we have containers, all we need to do is run containers on them. But how do you do that the right way so that containers are spun up when the users increase and destroyed when load reduces? How do you ensure if a container fails, it is automatically brought back up? And that's where container orchestration platforms come in. Kubernetes is a popular container orchestration platform that helps declare how containers should be deployed and ensure that it is always run in the same way as declared. It can help auto scale containers as well as the underlying infrastructure based on need and manage resources on the underlying servers to ensure optimal resource utilization. By now we have developers pushing code to a central GitHub repository. The CI CD pipeline then pulls the code to the build server, builds it to Docker images, and then that image is used to test the application in the test environment and finally deployed in a production environment as containers by Kubernetes. The underlying infrastructure is still one big challenge. So every time a new server is to be provisioned, it needs to be set up in the exact same way as the others in the cluster. It needs to have the right resources assigned to it, the right version of operating system. Probably there is some storage attached to it and there may be some uh, kernel settings or other software that needs to be pre-configured on it, such as the Docker runtime or the necessary Kubernetes packages. And all of these need to have the exact same configuration. So this is going to be one big challenge if you have to click through the cloud platform GUI each time a server needs to be provisioned. And this can take a lot of time and can lead to human errors in uh, misconfiguring infrastructure, resulting in having to rebuild the entire server. To automate the provisioning of these servers, tools like Terraform can be used. Terraform automates the provisioning and configuration of servers irrespective of what cloud platforms they are on. And it ensures that the servers configured are always in the same state. If someone manually changes the configuration on these servers, and not through Terraform, it changes it back to make sure that the state defined is preserved. The state is defined by configuring a Terraform manifest file that looks like this. It's a snippet from a Terraform manifest file that has a list of servers and their configuration. So yes, it looks like code because it is code. And that's why it's called as infrastructure as code. All of the infrastructure configuration, including the virtual machines, the storage buckets, the VPC, etc., is now stored in the form of code and is stored in source code repositories. That way, it can be considered as any other code and be tracked. If changes are needed, then make changes to the code and run the Terraform apply command. Now, once the servers are provisioned, the configuration of these servers can be automated by tools like Ansible. So while Terraform is more of an infrastructure provisioning tool, Ansible is an automation tool that helps configure these infrastructure once provisioned. Note that there are many areas both Terraform and Ansible overlap, 
Both of these tools can provision infrastructure and automate software configuration on them, but each has its own benefits in different areas. So while Terraform is used mostly for provisioning and deprovisioning infrastructure, Ansible is used for post-configuration activities such as installing the software and configuring them on those servers. So similar to Terraform, Ansible uses uh, code to configure servers. It's called Ansible Playbooks. And this code also goes to the source code repository on GitHub. Now, provisioning is not all. We now want to maintain it as well. We want to be able to monitor these servers and take preventive measures. We want to be able to see the CPU utilization on these servers, the memory consumption, monitor the processes, identify what process is causing higher uh, consumption, etc. And that's where tools like Prometheus come in. Prometheus collects information or metrics from the different servers and stores it centrally. Now, not only do we want to collect metrics, we also want to be able to visualize them graphically. And that's where tools like Grafana comes in. Grafana helps make sense out of the data collected by Prometheus by visualizing it into charts and graphs. Now, all of that together help us go from an idea to building it, deploying it, getting it out to our users fast. And it doesn't stop there, getting feedback uh, from our users, reviewing them, brainstorming, and coming up with new ideas and implementing those ideas um, is now a breeze. So any code pushed now goes through the pipeline and we have def that we have defined and is automatically built, tested, and deployed sooner, resulting in multiple deploys to production every day. And once deployed, it is monitored and more feedback is retrieved from the user. And this cycle repeats onto infinity. And that is what DevOps is. DevOps is a combination of people, processes, and tools that work together in going from an idea to execution and delivering high quality software consistently. Well, that's all for this video. I hope you enjoyed this high level overview of the different tools and technologies. And if you like the video, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. And if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Until next time, goodbye.